This text offers us the only canonical, credible account of Jesus as a teenager. And he finds himself drawn to a house of worship, the temple in Jerusalem. I don't know if most teenagers sneak away from their parents to go to church, but that's Jesus for you. (laughs) Now that being said, this Confirmation Sunday, 14 of our youth have come here for very much the same reason. You'll hear it in their own words as I reference their faith papers, but each and every one of these students have chosen to join the church, not because they all subscribe to the same beliefs, but because this church feels like a place where they belong, a place that feels like home. A reading from Luke. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of this. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Do you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he had said to them. (coughs) Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Let us pray. Everlasting and almighty God, may the words of my mouth the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been in a place that just feels off somehow? Wrong? Like it shouldn't really exist? So-called liminal spaces, places that aren't really here or there, lost in time, like abandoned shopping malls or new housing developments that no one lives in yet. These can evoke an uncanny feeling. For years, our entire living room had been such a place, neither here nor there, existing somewhere between the concept of living room and something else that I can't quite describe. There was an old couch, but no television. The walls were devoid of decoration or art. Furniture that didn't belong anywhere else might get shoved in there for a few days or weeks. Our golden retriever, Furley, would stockpile all of the socks that she stole there, knowing that no one would ever find them. Well, my wife had finally had enough of this wasted space. Angela, God bless her, made it her personal mission to make this room the sort of place where family might congregate, hang out, spend time together, you know, a living room. She repainted the walls, put up some artwork, brought in a TV and some potted plants, but most importantly of all, she decided to buy two recliners, one for each of us. That's how you know you've reached a certain age, (laughs) isn't it? One day you're sharing a milkshake with two straws, and before you know it, matching recliners are your idea of a good time. (laughs) Well, when I sat in that recliner for the first time, I just fell in love with it. I had the sudden urge to read a newspaper, to tell the dog to fetch my slippers. They sunk into its soft, brown embrace. I never wanted to leave. I love it. It feels safe. It feels like a place where I belong. It feels like home. Jesus was a refugee for the first few years of his childhood when his family lived in Egypt. And as an adult, he became a wandering preacher, never staying in one place for too long, but rather couch surfing with friends or sleeping beneath the stars. 
One gets the sense that Jesus never really felt at home in this world, that he existed in a liminal space, neither here nor there. I mean, no one ever really understood him, least of all his friends or even his own family. Jesus lives a step outside of society, on the fringes, seemingly more at ease in the wilderness than in polite company. And if Jesus really is an avatar of God, the word made flesh, this all begins to make a little more sense. Jesus doesn't feel at home in this world because he isn't. My kingdom, he flat out admits in the Gospel of John, is not of this world. There are fleeting moments, though, when Jesus does seem to feel a little more at ease, when he's sharing a meal with his friends or in today's text as a young teenager in the temple of Jerusalem. It was believed in those days that the temple was literally God's house, that God's spirits resided in the innermost chamber, the Holy of Holies, which was more or less God's living room. Naturally, Jesus would be drawn to this place, much as we are all drawn here to this place because it feels safe. It feels like a place we belong. It feels like home. For centuries, Christianity has been defined by its beliefs. We're all here because we believe in the same things, and you can't join our little club unless you believe the same things, too. And a lot of people just can't get on board with this kind of dogmatic attitude anymore, hence the steady decline in church membership over the decades. A lot of folks just don't want anything to do with a church where, as one of our confirmation students observes in her faith paper, people are judged for who they love and the color of their skin, and many times use God to justify their decisions. They tell people they have sinned and will never be accepted, that they don't belong. Fortunately, that's not the kind of church we are. I personally prefer to think of the church as a place defined not by its rigid dogma, but by its community, its people. One of our students says it well, I think the purpose of the church, he writes, is to create a place where everyone can speak about their beliefs and learn about religion. I also think it's a place where people can connect with one another and create friendships that will last the rest of their lives. This church, I believe, is a faith community on a shared journey who know, trust, and depend on each other, acting together to promote the flourishing of all. We share some basic values, love, grace, justice, and so on, but we don't all believe the exact same things about God or Jesus or about this world, and that's okay. Being confirmed, as our youngest new members are today, doesn't mean adhering to a strict theological code it just means that you want to be a part of this community. Indeed, if the papers they wrote about their faith are any indication, our students bring a wide array of beliefs reflecting the theological diversity of our membership. God believes in second chances, and so do I, one student reflects on forgiveness and grace. God brings forgiveness to even the worst of people. Others believe in more serious consequences for our actions. Hell is a dark place where people that don't make smart decisions go, another argues. Hell is where you go to face your consequences. I believe in heaven, another shares. The afterlife to me looks like an endless dream. God walks with you and tells you about his story and shows you this home, your new home for eternity. I believe there's a heaven and hell, another student claims, but maybe the people who serve their time in hell are able to go to heaven. P.S. Eat your vegetables. <laughs> Just in case, I guess. 
On the other end of the spectrum, there are students who are open about their struggles to believe in God or Jesus or the more supernatural elements of our faith, if you will. I personally do not believe that a God exists, admits one young man. God is a symbol of the perfect human, someone we should all look up to and strive to be. I believe in the God of the gaps, writes another. To explain that in simple terms, I believe in science entirely, and when science can't explain something, I start to think that's where God comes into play. Jesus is a really good role model, a great guy, one student concedes, but I don't think he's the son of God. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? I don't know, he wonders. But he goes on to say that the church exists for the sake of community and that he wants to be a part of that. He also writes, Seth's sermons are absolutely hilarious <laughs> and the message sticks with me because I remember the jokes long after I forget the real meat and potatoes of the thing. <laughs> Bit of a backhanded compliment, but... Uh, Guess I'll take what I can get. For some, Christianity is a religion, a belief in a higher power. For others, it's a philosophy, a way to live your life ethically. Both strive to follow the teachings of Jesus, and there's room for both here on this journey that we all share together. For a while, one young woman confesses, I was planning on pulling out of confirmation. I was constantly conflicted because I didn't see myself as a Christian. But I couldn't bring myself to break away from the church because I have always admired the community. The church is so welcoming to everyone that I can't help but adore it. I always feel so safe here and part of a truly great community. Religion isn't supposed to be a scary cult, another argues. It's supposed to be a wide variety of beliefs and a way of life. Still, he asserts that people should have good morals in respect for a higher power, love, joy, peace, kindness, and self-control. Hard to come by, he says, in this toxic world. That's a harsh description of our world today, but I don't think it's wrong. Toxic may well be the perfect word to describe it. The current state of the world is not good, another student writes. People are in wars, fighting and killing each other over land. I know God isn't happy with the world right now. I hope most churches can bring hope and light to him. And that raises the matter of the church's role in society, the church's role in making this world a better place and in building the kingdom. The society we live in today, to me at least, feels like a liminal space, caught between a world we once knew and another yet to be born. And in a sense, that leaves us all feeling a bit adrift and aimless, homeless, existentially speaking. Perhaps it's fitting then that homelessness is becoming one of the defining troubles of our time. With housing and rental costs soaring beyond reach, insurance becoming unsustainable in some places, and so many Americans living paycheck to paycheck, more and more folks are finding themselves living on the street or in their car with no place to go. And rather than find real solutions for these problems, it feels like the powers that be are doubling down on cruelty. Municipalities have invested millions in hostile architecture that prevents folks from congregating or sleeping outside. I'm talking about things like sloping window sills that discourage sitting down, unnecessary rails and armrests on park benches that prevent lying down, bolts and spikes on otherwise flat surfaces that discourage loitering, and sometimes even loud, annoying music piped into public spaces where unhoused folks are known to sleep. As one satirical writer puts it, by investing billions of dollars in anti-homeless architecture, we will enhance the aesthetics of our city, attracting people who want their town to have so many 
spikes and random pipes, it looks increasingly like Bowser's castle from Super Mario Brothers. The Supreme Court is currently weighing a decision to outlaw sleeping outside in public spaces, in short, criminalizing vagrancy, as if most of these folks had any other choice. And if they decide to go through with it, unhoused people could be fined, which is a bad joke, really. They have nothing to pay it with. Or even put in jail. And I don't mean to sound cynical, but for-profit prisons get about $40,000 a year in taxpayer dollars. Prison labor is also absurdly cheap and enormously profitable, producing billions in value every year. In Florida, I just learned this, prisoners have to pay $50 a day for their own cell. And if they're released early, they have to keep paying it until their original sentence is fulfilled. So yeah, toxic sounds about right. With the current state of the world, one student writes in his paper, I think the church can play a big role if we acknowledge the world as it is. Jesus would have wanted us to fight against inequality, he says, because he would have. I think the church in the future will become a place that takes in people that are homeless, another reflects. And while he means that in a literal sense, and I hope he's right, I would argue that the church takes in spiritually vagrant people every day. Those of us who are a bit lost between here and there, who don't know what to believe, Folks looking for a community and a place to belong. Folks looking for a place to call home. I used to watch this YouTube video with my son that always makes me a little bit weepy. I'm not crying, I tell him, I've just been chopping onions. It's one of those stop motion Lego videos. This one is set in the Star Wars universe and it features an Imperial Stormtrooper and a Jedi who fall in love, just go with it, <laughs> and they get married and they try to start a new life together. And the trouble is every time they buy or build a house, it gets destroyed by various threats typical of the Star Wars franchise. Their first house is blown up by the Empire, the second trashed by robots, and the third overrun with Ewoks. Then they fly from planet to planet in their little spaceship, undeterred, looking for a new place to settle down. And every time they find one, they put up a little sign that reads, home. And every time it's wrecked, they take their sign and move on. I'd love to show you this entire video, but it's nearly 20 minutes long. So <laughs> here's an edited version of it that I think captures the spirit of the thing.
kopir kata hatari suci. Friends, home is not a place, no more than the church is a building or a belief. Home is where your people are. People who, in the words of one of our students, are there for you when you're depressed, angry, happy, or sad. Becoming part of a community means that you're never alone. Or as another one writes, First Congregational Church is a place that is loving, and accepting of my strengths and weaknesses. The church is a place where we can go and pray and be close to each other and to God. We can't stay here comfortable, no more than I can hibernate in my recliner, much as I'd like to. We all have to get up and go out into the world and do our best to live as Jesus taught us to live, to fight for justice to help the helpless, to speak out for those without a voice or a home. But today, friends, you are home. Welcome home. Amen. <laughs> 